Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Tree School Online. I'm Glenn Ahrens. I'm your OSU Extension Forestry and Natural Resources Agent in Clackamas, Marion, and Hood River County. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program uh, and the Partnership for Forestry Education. I want to give a special recognition to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for leading the project and helping us uh, get this tree school online going. Uh, they also benefit from a grant from the US Forest Service and Oregon Department of Forestry to cover our expenses for tree school online. The webinars are scheduled every Tuesday from now until July 28th. There's two webinars in the morning, 10, 10 o'clock, and then another one at three o'clock. Uh, they're 90 minute webinars. I have some housekeeping details before I introduce our, our speaker. Uh, first, uh, the Zoom toolbar. Uh, most of you should be seeing this located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can scroll your cursor over this area and it should pop up if you don't see it. Uh, on some uh, hardware such as iPads, the toolbar could be on top uh, and you can access uh, many features from the toolbar. Your audio as attendees is muted unless uh, we unmute you, which we're generally not doing. And the video is not available uh, for attendees. Um, for the question and answer Q&A, uh, we would like you to put your questions in the Q&A box. And anytime during the presentation, if you have questions for Steve, uh, you can put those in the box and then we're gonna pick those up mostly at the end. Um, we're not able to take spoken questions. The chat we'd like you to use if you're having problems. Um, we've got uh, Ryan Gordon helping us mine the chat room and he'll be monitoring that. Uh, please don't post questions in chat, put those in the Q&A. And also you can use the chat uh, for uh, individual uh, questions amongst yourselves. Uh, resources, so the handouts and resources for all of these Tree School online webinars are gonna be posted after the fact, um, along with the recording of the webinar. You'll see that at the knowyourforest.org uh, Tree School online page, and you can click on the webinar, you can see the description, you'll see instructor resources uh, as something you can access after the fact. And I know Steve has a fair amount of handouts for you. As I said, the, the webinars are recorded and you'll be able to see those and, and tell your friends and they can watch them after the fact. Another thing we're gonna be doing uh, in the presentation is having polls. So we're gonna ask you questions. Um, we're gonna start out with one at the beginning uh, and then another one at the end. Um, that will pop up on your screen when I enable it. And then it only takes about a minute or so uh, you can all vote uh, if you care to. We'd like to see um, your answers and we'll pop up the first poll pretty soon as we get started. And if you um, don't see the polls, you can check on the toolbar and see a lighted button um, that would appear uh, when the poll pops up. Uh, you can press the button and the poll should pop up. So with that, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Steve Fitzgerald. And Steve is our extension silviculture specialist um, he's been an extension uh, faculty for 35 years, I think. Uh, started out on the coast and moved to Central Oregon. And lately he's been a professor of silviculture and a fire specialist at OSU. He's also the director of our college research force, uh, which encompasses about 15,000 acres across different tracks in Oregon. Uh, so with that, I'd ask Steve to uh, come on and turn your microphone on. Hi, everybody. Very good. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Um, this will be a, a really good journey. Um, I hope I normally like to take people out to see these. So I've had to spend quite a bit of time figuring out how I can make this visually attractive to you. And so one of the things I've never done this by Zoom. So if you have any uh, improvements that we could make as far as visuals, that that would be great. So um, anyway, I'll turn it back over to Glenn for the polling. Very good. I think your next slide tells us that we're oh. on the polls. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna launch a poll and you should see it pop up on your screen. And if you would put your answers in, uh, we just wanna find out uh, more about where you're from. We like to know our audience and where you're from, uh, telling us about yourself, if you're a woodland owner or a private natural resource professional, agency natural resource professional. And also if, if you own or manage forest land, uh, how many acres, uh, like to get a feel for who's out there. And we'll just take about a minute um, 
we see them coming in pretty quick. And usually we uh, get about 80% response and then I will share the results. Okay, well, getting to, I think it's about your last chance. The votes have stopped coming in. A couple more. Wow, we're at 90%. That's the highest I've seen. I'm going to call it good and share the results. So you should all see those results. It looks like today about 60% of us are from the Willamette Valley area and uh, quite a few from the Oregon coast. Uh, Southwest Oregon, Central Eastern Oregon, 3% uh, from Washington, and about 9% from elsewhere in the U.S. So welcome to uh, Tree School, Oregon. Uh, as far as uh, the makeup, uh, woodland owners, about two-thirds of us. Private natural resource professionals, about 9%. Agency folks are 20%. And others, so people that aren't um, really involved in forestry directly, uh, only about 9%. As far as acres, uh, Right in the middle of the pack, 10 to 40 acres, about 30% of us, um, about 20% again that don't own land. And then there's um, about 11% with 100 to 1,000 acres. So Steve, that should give you a good idea of, of who's out there. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it back over to you. Great, thanks. Um, so um, what I'm gonna do today is um, we're gonna cover these things to talk about some silviculture terminology, look a little background on tree and stand growth, um, uh, talk about silviculture systems, and at the end, talk a little bit about how to get it done, uh, timber harvesting roads and skid trails. Um, so um, I've included examples from uh, Western Oregon as well as from the dry side. Um, I see there's a few people from Central and Eastern Oregon. Um, that's great. Um, so I guess uh, ultimately uh, there are a couple of questions you need to ask. Uh, and the first is, um, you know, what do you want your forest to look like when it grows up? Um, and uh, this is, uh, uh, here there's a depiction of a range of different kind of forest stand structures. Uh, these are not all that you could create. Uh, this shows a lot of conifers, no hardwoods. Uh, but there could be a mix depending on where your property is located. But probably uh, what's uh, more important, what this presentation is about, is how am I going to get it there to some uh, kind of future condition that uh, I I'm managing for. Um, please note that in the um, in the here, you'll see a lot of graphs. And so if you, um, if you look at... Um, the graph here. This is a diameter class down below. You're going to see a lot of these. So from small diameter to large diameter. And this is trees per acre uh, by each of these diameter classes. So if you take a look at this, this one here in the in, uh, B is that we've got a lot of little trees and progressively fewer and fewer smaller trees. And so this graph depicts what's being shown here. And likewise, in this one, a lot, a lot of little trees and a smaller number of large trees. Okay, so, um, so, so this is really about um, designing your forest, um, taking what its ecological potential is and marrying that up with your management objectives or your vision and, and, and your vision is really important because that sets the stage for where you're going to take this forest and the timing and choice of treatments that you might use now and over time. Uh, some of you may be at the beginning of this journey trying to figure out what you want your forest to look like, what do you want it to provide you, and others of you may be further along in this process. So silvix. So silvix comes from the Latin word for forest. Um, it is really the, the study of how trees and forests grow, reproduce, and respond to changes in their environment. It's analogous to the science of forest ecology. And knowledge of, um, of, a, of a species uh, response to environmental influences can help guide 
uh, how you manage your forest and determine their success. So silviculture systems now are really a planned set of, of treatments. Um, um, well, let's see here, let me back up. Okay, so silviculture is really the art and science of, of, um, of managing um, or controlling the establishment and growth, composition, health, and quality of your forest to meet your objectives. Uh, notice that I said it's both an art and a science. Although we, there's a lot of science to guide forest management, sometimes you have to adapt ideas to fit your forest and, and see if it works. And that's, that's the art. So uh, civil culture systems are really just a, a planned set of treatments that you would do to regenerate or manipulate and harvest as a series of treatments uh, in perpetuity. So we can think of these different uh, types of forests, maybe on a continuum from even age to two aged to multiple aged. And this presentation will talk a lot about that and show examples that we have uh, for that. And some of these may be of something you wanna try on your, on your property. But another way to look at this um, is through a harvest system where you uh, regenerate, um, let me get my pointer here. You regenerate, you're planting trees, you're controlling the vegetation, and as the trees grow over time, you're tending to them. And it could be from thinning or pruning or doing some other kinds of treatments and eventually conducting what we call a harvest regeneration um, a treatment to create an even age or two age or multiple age forest. So one of the things in thinking about harvest regeneration systems would be it's, it's, um, it's really about how you, how you bring regeneration uh, into, into your stand, uh, how, the growing space that you create. Uh, to regenerate uh, trees. And this is particularly true for multiple age forests. So to maybe provide some background so that, and some of you have seen this before, but to make sure everyone's on the same, uh, same level here, is that uh, we're gonna talk about growing space and site occupancy, how stands uh, develop and, and develop into crown classes. Um, So you all know about photosynthesis, you know, utilizing um, sunlight as the energy, the, 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 the yellow um, arrow uh, creates the energy for which the trees can take in CO2, water and nutrients and uh, produce uh, carbon or carbohydrate that uh, creates biomass and about half the weight of a tree or wood is, is carbon. And of course, it gives off uh, CO2 that we all benefit from. But um, in thinking about this, the concept of growing space is really important in that photosynthetic process, is that growing space is really comprised of sunlight, water, nutrients, and of course, space. And collectively, we call these site resources. Um, but it's not so much how much space a tree has, it's the quality of the space, what's in it as far as the soil, its, its um, nutrient uh, capacity, and its water holding capacity. So um, one of uh, ecological uh, truths is that the amount of resources available for trees to grow is fixed, and that, but it does vary by site. So in this coastal uh, spruce forest, where you have 80,000 board feet to the acre, is that you would manage this differently than this forest on the right, which is a pine forest in, that receives only 10 inches of precipitation. And uh, this is a fully stocked stand. And so how you manage them is different based on their, their productivity and their carrying capacity. Another way to look at this is think about uh, resources as a, as a bucket of resources. Uh, here we have one on the left that has a deep bucket this could be our west side forests that have uh, the capacity to 
sustain or grow a lot of biomass and a lot of large uh, trees. Uh, whereas in Eastern Oregon, you have less resources. And so the number of trees and their sizes are, are much smaller. Another way to look at this is the bucket on the left could be a north slope and the bucket on the right could be a south slope where it's drier and hotter. But another ecological and really physiological truth is that the amount of the resources that trees need is really proportional to size. And what I mean, uh, and so big trees require uh, or consume more resources than small trees. And that's because of the photos, photosynthetic factory that this large tree has compared to the small tree. And it's gonna consume a lot more water and nutrients uh, in the process. Another way to look at it is that alternatively, one big tree is equal to many small trees with respect to resource consumption. Thus, at any point in time, you could have, you could have only some trees of a given size or a mix of sizes. Now, this is really important when we start talking about managing forests with multiple age classes on a, on a single acre or across your property. Well, after a disturbance, say after a harvest or a fire, if we plant trees, um, they start off, um, if they get above the grass and the shrubs, is that uh, at, at this early age, at year 10, they may all kind of be what we call dominant. That's what D stands for. But over time, um, things begin to change. That is, some trees slow down uh, in comparison to their neighbor and they drop out of the stand. This is called self thinning. And this is important to know. Um, and here, all the trees are the same species, uh, just as this simple example, they're all the same species and they all arrived on the site at the same time. But you can see over time, if you look at tree number two, is that over time it's getting squeezed out by tree number one and three. And there could be a lot of reasons for this. It could be the uh, tree one and three are genetically faster growers, uh, maybe the uh, uh, tree number two got browsed and, and got held behind and, and usually they don't catch up. Um, but you can imagine though, you can change the trajectory of these if you, for example, if we remove tree number three, early on say at age 20 or 25 in an early thinning, all of a sudden now we've changed, the, we can change the trajectory for tree number two and tree number four. And so this is, gets into the timing of, of treatments and affecting the development of your stand and, and your forest. And um, also these crown classes, it's important to note that dominant and co-dominant trees uh, may, may constitute 50% of the total number of trees per acre, but they constitute probably two thirds of the growth. And so in thinning, we tend to take out um, or in forest health treatments, remove the, the intermediate suppressed or any trees that are, have some other kind of issues health related. Okay, so in thinking about these systems, even age, um, we're really talking about uh, regeneration from seed or seedlings. Uh, coppice is the management of uh, trees from sprouts and so that's regeneration from vegetative sprouting, not from sexual reproduction. Uh, 2-H stands generally from uh, seed, natural seeding or seedlings and multiple age from seed or planted seedlings. Um, but in thinking about, we're gonna go, I'm gonna go through all of these, but um, one of the things to think about as I go through these systems is to think about the pros and the cons. So, about access, because all of these uh, require access to some degree, some more than others. Uh, damage, uh, damage to um, uh, uh, residual trees and, and, and soil. I gotta move my uh, forest health, uh, relates to wind, fire, insects, and disease. Stand development and composition. Equipment and skill needed to, to get uh, what you want done and uh, the frequency of retreatment. Some of these systems um, you enter more frequently than others. And of course, economics, what does it cost to get done? So in thinking about these, it's not just about one question, it's about a myriad of questions. So I probably just blew your mind of all the things you have to think about. Sorry, 
didn't mean to do that. But anyway, um, so uh, let's let's take a look at um, some even age management methods. And here um, you're probably familiar with many of the some of these, particularly clear cutting. Um, but there's some others, uh, sea tree cutting and shelter wood cutting that I'm going to cover. Um, and so the first one is uh, creating even age forests. And so here's that graph again. And in depicting the stand up above, the, the small trees are on, um, on the left. The big tree, the biggest tree is on the right. And uh, that's the upper end or the uh, tail end, upper end of the bell-shaped curve. And of course, most of the trees are, are in the middle or the average. But essentially, as most of you probably know, clear cutting just removes pretty much the entire stand. Um, here we have a 60 to 70 year old stand that was harvested um, and uh, with logging equipment and went to the mill and then reforested. Um, the, uh, so basically replacing one even age stand with another even age stand. And uh, here we have the tree seedlings that have been planted at some density 10 by 10 or um, and uh, the vegetation was controlled to uh, assure their survival and growth. Um, when it comes to clear cutting um, these days is that you're if it's above 25 acres you're required to leave some uh, live uh, trees for for future uh, wildlife habitat and snags and of course if you already have uh, oops, if you already have some snags, um, that's great. Um, and if you can keep them and they don't pose a danger to your operator, that's great. This, this one here um, uh, has, a, has a cavity right, right there if you, can, if you can see it. Okay, um, over time there have been different types of, of clear cutting methods um, that have um, been done. Um, and this includes, I gotta move my, this includes strip clear cutting and this works for species that have light seed and, and can blow across the harvest unit. And so a lot of times lodgepole pine, uh, this can work. Um, you may not like the regular uh, shape of these, um, but uh, you can see that we have the first cut and then once it's regenerated, another strip next to these, on either side of these would be cut to regenerate that. Um, patch clear cutting where um, these are small, say uh, four, uh, five to six acres created in a kind of amoeba shape to kind of uh, represent a kind of a natural disturbance pattern. And this particular one now is eight years old. You can see the regeneration is up and growing. Um, and then uh, there's one called clear cutting with structural retention. And this is one that I've been doing quite a bit of on our research for us, where uh, we will conduct a clear cut, but then leave a significant amount of trees within it that um, for wild, future wildlife habitat. And in this case, we also created some snags. So you can probably see uh, here, let me get my pointer, um, some trees that have been topped here in here and here and um, and these were topped to jump start some snags and we've had woodpeckers actually working on these and these other trees here will remain and die on their own over time or maybe they might stay oh, remain alive and just enrich the structure of this uh, clear cut that uh, was planted back in 2016 and so this is what I'm showing here is right after the right after the harvest. Um, so you can still see the slash piles that we burned um, and we did some vegetation control. This is a warmer, drier site to ensure that our trees would get up and grow. And I believe you'll have a, a session later by Dan Stark uh, uh, on reforestation. Um, okay, so um, So you may want to think about if you have any questions, um, you can type them into the Q and A. Um, I don't want to spend too much time here because we'll have a lot of time at the end. But if there's any kind of, did I, if I left anybody in the dust, 
uh, if there's any any questions that need to be uh, resolved right now, uh, this would be great. Um, so, Glenn. Yeah, Steve. Um, actually, there is one question I'm sure you could answer, and it's quite pertinent. Um, to what you just talked about. So the question is residual tree, the slide referencing things to think about, specifically damage, what is a residual tree? So a residual tree would be any tree that you have decided to leave behind. So um, so like in that last photograph with the, with the clear cut, with the uh, uh, trees that we left for habitat, those would be called residual trees, we're leaving them behind. In a thinning, if you were thinning a stand and you're removing some trees, the residual trees would be the ones you've left to continue to grow. Okay, and let's see, there's one more question. Define snag. Snag. So a snag is just a dead tree. Um, so a lot of the trees that, and, and, and so it's just, yeah, just a dead tree. And they're really important from a habitat and structure uh, perspective. Okay, well, that's all the questions for right now. And I encourage you all to ask your questions right when they come to mind so you don't lose it. And then we'll be having a good session at the end. So go ahead, Steve. Okay, great. So as most of you know, clear cutting uh, tends to be the dominant form of, of regenerate, harvesting and regenerating stamp, particularly in Western Oregon. Um, I'm gonna go through some systems here that are probably uh, used less on the West side have been used in drier sites, um, um, but anyway, we'll move on. So another method that creates an even age stand is the seed tree method. So we could take an original stand like this. It may be 50, 60, 70 years old. Um, hopefully maybe in the past it had been thin to kind of create some vigorous trees. Um, but the idea here is that you remove pretty much all the trees except for maybe one to about uh, eight trees to the acre. And the purpose here is that you leave good trees that have the capability to produce cones um, and they then throw seed uh, uh, and you uh, get regeneration established. Now it's not quite as quick or as easy as that this nice little diagram I just showed. Uh, one of the problems we have is that with with the uh, anything that relies on natural seeding is that cone production in Pacific Northwest tree species is highly irregular. So for example, um, Douglas fir produces abundant cone crops about every oh seven years or so. Um, and in some years, very little. Uh, Ponderosa pine about every eight. Uh, Western larch like you see over in uh, Eastern Oregon about every 12 to 15 uh, in Western Larch. They're not, uh, they don't produce a lot of cones very often and oftentimes the cones have insects in them making the seeds unviable. But uh, sometimes trees are also planted to supplement and have natural seeding as a supplement to what you've already planted. Um, of course, regeneration established and in the past, these seed, the overstory seed trees had been removed and, and, their, and their volume captured to basically then let the stand continue to grow much like a, like a clear cut. Um, there's very few examples of this that I've been able to find in Western Oregon and most likely because of the wind that we get that can topple these seed trees if they're not wind firm. So here's an example of uh, on the dry side of a seed tree cut that includes Western larch and Douglas fir and you can see that underneath it has regenerated, but note that the regeneration, this is all nat from natural seeding, is highly irregular. Um, not like an even spacing that you would have, like say, if you had clear cut and planted. Uh, this is a seed tree cut with now the seed trees removed, and this includes larch and uh, lodgepole pine. And so here it resembles much like, like a clear cut. So uh, now I'm gonna move on to um, a shelter wood, which is just a heavier form of a seed tree cut. And so we'll start with the same stand. And um, I, I show here a preparatory cut and, a, and probably the seed tree cut could also benefit from this. 
So what a preparatory cut, it's like a thinning, but instead of spacing trees to get an optimum spacing, is that you're, re you're removing, you're t leaving trees that have a high probability of producing cones. That is, they're healthy, they've got a, a large crown, uh, because producing cones, sexual reproduction requires a lot of energy. So trees that are vigorous and healthy tend to produce more cones uh, than trees that aren't. So here, uh, you're doing, uh, trying to uh, improve their chances of producing cones and also create some wind firmness. And this might occur five or 10 years before we actually do the seed cut. And this is much like the seed tree where now we have a heavier number of trees, say anywhere from uh, eight to maybe 20 large trees left per acre um, uh, to produce seed and uh, to provide even some shelter, particularly on harsh south slopes, or it can provide shelter in frost, frosty areas. So for example, in central Oregon around Sun River where you have a lot of lodgepole, it's very frosty and uh, have maintaining a little bit of an overstory can actually protect seedlings as they're germinating from frost because it prevents the re-radiation of heat, of heat uh, into the atmosphere. And then, of course, these uh, in the past, uh, the sea tree, the uh, overwood trees here have been removed and the understory now released and essentially takes on the look of a, of a clear cut. So let's see here. Okay, so here's an example. This is um, a shelter wood cut uh, in D Douglas fir. And uh, there's some ponderosa pine in there. Uh, this is a shelter wood that I uh, marked and, um, and worked in. And we left trees with good crowns uh, so that they are better able to produce seed. Uh, tried to remove trees that had any kind of mistletoe, which, uh, would per which could infect the understory as it was regenerating. Uh, in Western Oregon, I found a few examples of shelter wood cutting in the past, um, but uh, probably the most prevalent is on uh, our OSU research forest. This one here is a shelter wood that is comprised of an overstory of about uh, uh, 15 trees to the acre and uh, an understory that was planted, but we also got a, a fair amount of natural regeneration. So in some cases, like you see, in here, it's actually too thick and it's time to um, perhaps do a pre-commercial thinning. And this second photo shows a shelter wood over in uh, Eastern Oregon. This is by Battle Mountain. This is on a mixed conifer site. And it's a shelter wood that um, has retained uh, Western Larch, Douglas fir, uh, a little bit of Grand fir and Ponderosa pine. Again, notice here the regeneration is um, spotty and irregular, um, but this is um, um, one that looks on, on the east side. Okay. So, hey, Glenn, um, have there been any other questions that we might wanna take, some brief ones? Um, yeah, sure. There are some. Um, first question here is, um, can a snag be either standing or fallen? Okay, on the snag, a snag is usually standing. Once it falls over or a portion of the top falls over, then it's called a down log or sometimes coarse woody debris. And coarse woody debris is important for decay and also wildlife use it um, uh, as well. Another question, um, what kind of time frame are you looking at for a seed tree cut to regenerate? How much slower than a clear cut replant? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Probably five to 15 years. And because, it, because it's uncertain, because of the cone crop and the other thing is you need some disturbance in mineral soil, I'll talk about that later, is that oftentimes you may have to write, have an alternate plan written um, because in Oregon, you have to have the site reforested within a few years after, after harvest, where natural seeding or regeneration may take longer than that. Um, so um, 
um, working with ODF to come up with an alternate plan. Um, I still recommend planting some trees and letting natural regeneration augment that over time. And the good point is the Department of Forestry who administers the forest practice rules. That's the subject of the, this afternoon's webinar. Uh, Perfect. Uh, all right. Uh, there's one more question. I noticed that in the seed tree method, thickets develop. Do you go through and thin those periodically? E yes. Um, so like in this photo here, let me put my, my little, so yes. Uh, so you may have a thicket here and a thicket over there. I, I would PCT these. Um, um, and of course here you don't have much, so you don't have to do anything there. So it's really like a spot PCT that you would, that you would do uh, in, a, in a situation where the regeneration is irregular in that, in that way. All right, thanks. Oh, well, that's it for now, keep going. Okay, all right, so now we're gonna move on to two-aged. Okay, so two-aged is like taking your shelter wood and instead of taking the, the overstory trees off here the, in the removal cut um, at the at the end um, is that you leave this the overstory on and so we have some examples of this uh, we have some landowners that we've written up case studies so here's um, here's a here's a case on the Hayes property which is located near Timber Oregon kind of into the foothills of the coast range and here um, uh, they uh, did a shelter wood cut and they're ret retaining and managing the overstory trees while they've regenerated the understory. And so here you see both overstory trees and abundant regeneration. Uh, some of this has been planted to Douglas fir and cedar because uh, it's a site that will support cedar. And then some have come in um, on their own. Uh, this is what we have plots in this this case study. And so this is what the stand looks like uh, based on those plots. And uh, you, if you look at the lower right hand uh, diagram, you can see the cross section where you have the overstory trees and the understory. And um, you can see in that little uh, diagram, the tree, the, the, the shelter wood is, is not, does not have an even spacing. It's a little, the overstory is a little bit denser on the left and the understory trees are correspondingly smaller and some may be suppressed. So whoever asked the question about uh, pre-commercial thinning, some of the understory may need to be thin, but occasionally the, an overstory tree may need to come out uh, to release that. Um, and then capture that value um, in the tree. On the OSU research forest, we have probably the oldest two aged stands around. These are 30 plus years old. And here's a case um, on the McDonald near Lewisburg Saddle, where we have in the center is, um, is a uh, shelter wood uh, re that retained about eight to 12 large trees per acre. They were about 130 years old at the time. Those are the ones that have the orangey yellow uh, crowns. They're really big. And the purple is um, about a, a 28 year old understory of Douglas fir, both planted and with natural regeneration. There's also some hardwoods that were left, some oaks and cherries. And this stand, um, um, and the stand um, to the upper left is a clear cut that was put in uh, as a comparison. And the stand to the lower right, you can see some openings with little purple patches. That's a group selection cut that I'm going to talk about later. But anyway, this, um, this shelter wood, um, we got big trees now that are about 150 years old that were left and they were, are not going to be harvested. They were left for wildlife habitat. And we went in and did a commercial thinning of the understory. Uh, at this point, the trees were 28 years old in the understory and give you a view of what they kind of look like. So here's one and you can see the slash. This is the, the uh, corridor that the harvester went in on. You can see a log 
that was cut out of the way. This was a standing live sea tree and it died and blew over. So we have woody debris on the ground, large woody debris. And this is just another shot of a, of a corridor where the harvester went in and thin trees on the left and the right. And you can see a large overstory uh, tree right there in the middle of the, in the back of the photo. Uh, the trees here were marked uh, because it was a research project. Normally we don't mark our cut to length thinnings like this. But anyway, over time, if, uh, for example, that large tree that you see in the center uh, dies, at, at year 50 or 60, we're going to come in and, and harvest this understory, and we may allocate some tree, a tree or two, where that large tree may die as a future um, uh, overstory tree to maintain the two-story uh, structure that we have. Now, the important part of this is that this was uh, done in 2014, and we had pileated woodpeckers working in here before harvest, and we have uh, pileated woodpeckers working in here after harvest. And so pileateds are important. They're the largest North American woodpecker, and they like large trees, and uh, they are still using this and finding it good habitat. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to multi-age or in, in, in textbooks, we call it uneven age management. And this is probably one of the, the, the more um, uh, difficult forms of management. It's actually fairly intensive. I mean, I know most people think of clear cutting and planting as intensive, but here uh, multi-age management is uh, fairly intensive and it's like, like up and personal because you're managing trees on a micro scale. So a multi-age stand or an uneven age stand is defined as having a stand with three or more age classes kind of on the same acre or across your property. And there are two ways to, to uh, create um, a, a multi-age stand. One is through single tree selection, which I will show, and one is through group selection. Um, if you look at this photo, uh, this photo is not from here, um, but look at this photo. There's um, a large mature tree on the right in the middle in the foreground. You've got seedlings and saplings. And then you've got some in the mid ground, you've got some middle sized trees and maybe some really big ones. And the difficulty here is knowing when to harvest that mature tree on the right so that you're always releasing and having your younger trees grow up and replace it. And so you're managing the growing space here um, around that big tree and the little trees next to it um, uh, um, consistently and in, 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 in small uh, areas around the, around the stand. If you don't manage the overstory density is that you your regeneration can become suppressed and then when you uh, and if it's suppressed too long and you decide to remove that large tree on the right, is that then they may not respond, the understory may not respond because you've, uh, because there's been suppressed too long. Well, I'm going to show you some examples here of both methods, um, but um, so again, here's this graph, and this is what a kind of a perfectly uh, uh, uneven age stand would look like with single tree selection where you've got a few large trees on the right hand side of this diagram, um, some medium uh, sized saw log trees there, um, some small um, saw log or pole sized trees there, and of course all your regeneration is down here on the low end, um, on the small diameter end. Another way to look at this is that you have different age classes under that, under that, in that diagram, 100, maybe 100 year old trees all the way down to 20 and maybe all the way down to two or three year old trees. And the idea here is that over time, all these diameter and age classes grow and they move to the right. So they grow from small trees on the left, eventually over time they grow to the right and they're harvested in, in light Frequent, uh, frequent but light entries. And so another way to look at this is that, say after 15 or 20 years, everything has moved to the right and all those little 
um, um, gra um, uh, dotted lines have moved to the right and what you would end up doing is harvesting uh, that amount of, of uh, timber that has grown above whatever threshold, uh, minimum threshold you've, you've set for the stand. And that's, that's, that's important. So, um, and you're removing trees all the way through the diameter distribution. You're, not, you're just not cutting big trees and leaving the rest. You're cutting some big trees, some medium trees, um, some small trees. And at some point you would pre-commercially thin the regeneration um, on, on the far left if, if you had uh, overabundance. Now, this is a, a really nice diagram and I wish we had a lot of examples of this perfect looking uneven age forest, but we don't. And in fact, oftentimes our stands are irregular. They may have an uneven age kind of uh, 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 shape going for them, but oftentimes you have excesses and deficits within the stand. And so here, uh, your job may be to remove trees where you have actual um, ex ex uh, excess trees. In this case, we have two places where we have excess trees. And then um, you may have some deficits. And if you have deficits in the regeneration end of this, you probably want to plant if you're not getting it naturally. We have a deficit in the middle of the, of the curve. And maybe we do nothing there because as those trees go to the right, at some point you won't have a deficit. And so um, it's a matter of finessing this through thinning uh, or, or through um, stocking control and regeneration. Now, the only example I've been able to find of individual tree selection in Westside Douglas fir is this stand near Philomet in the, uh, at the base of the coast range. And here we have a stand that has, you can see some understory Douglas fir and overstory trees of different sizes. Now, the regeneration here is highly variable and it's lacking in many spots because of um, the lack of natural seeding and regeneration, but also because of the shrub and brush competition, uh, which um, is, is also a problem when you come on these productive sites. Because once you open, create a little bit of an opening for, with a tree or two, is that usually the brush responds quicker than what natural seeding can do and even can overwhelm if you had planted these trees uh, in these little little openings um, that are created by removing a one tree or maybe two. Uh, so this stand is, um, has uh, some abundance in it, but it has a lot of deficits in different size classes. So individual tree selection really does not work well for, for uh, West Side Douglas fir um, and I'll come back to that. Now, for those of that you are on the east side, um, individual tree selection can work in ponderosa and mixed conifer stands. So this is a this is an example of a, one of our uh, demonstration forests out of Elgin, Oregon, up in northeast Oregon. This is our Obertufer track. It's 113 acres, but this particular stand is 55 acres and it's a case study in individual tree selection. And so here you can see the different age classes from large trees to medium-sized trees to small trees. It has a pretty good distribution. In 2005 and 6 we came in and did a selection cut. We entered and did a selection cut and we removed about 3,000 board feet on average per acre within this 55 acre stand. And this is what it looks like after. Um, you can still see a slash pile back there, kind of on the left side of the photo and in and back. But if you notice, it looks kind of the same as the prior photo, except that it's a little bit more porous. You can see through it a little bit. And so that kind of gives you uh, what it looks like. And here's what they look like side by side, so you can compare. And it really hasn't changed much, and it still looks pretty good. Um, um, and so... Um, we made money on this and we're planning on doing another one. Um, but to show you what this stand looks like after harvest, I'm gonna throw up a graph and this is what it uh, currently looks at. So let me explain this graph. Our target density for each of the size classes is in black. 
So if you look here, we're looking at the two inch class, we want about 50 trees per acre. The six inch class, we want about 25. And you can see this kind of uh, curve that we um, established. Before we did the selection cut is what you see in green. So we had a, a huge abundance of regeneration in that two inch class and less. Um, you can see here in the six inch class, we had a little extra than compared to our target. And, but you can see all the way, how the green changes all the way down. And then after harvest in the red is what the, the stand that you're looking at right now, right after harvest looks like. So we still have an abundance of regeneration, actually too much. Um, we are pretty close to our target on the six inch. Uh, we're right at the target on our 10 inch. We're just slightly below our target on the 14 inch and we're slightly above our target at 18 inches. We're above a little bit on 22 and at 26 and we're growing these only to about 28 inches is that we're just a little behind here on the, in the 26 inch class. Um, but we have plenty uh, that will grow from the 22 inch class if you compare the red bar at the 22 inch class those will grow to the right into the 26 inch and uh, we'll, we'll be able to uh, meet that, that stocking target uh, over time. So, um, so our problem is areas here with the regeneration, we have too much and we've been doing some spot regeneration. I have a heavy duty brush cutter that I go in and um, every time I'm there and I'll take on a few acres myself and brush cut some of those out um, we have a little bit of a deficit there, but uh, I, that, that deficit will work its way out as this stand continues to grow. So this is about as perfect of an uneven age stand as you'll ever find anywhere that I've seen. Um, but this is what it looks like right now. So this was taken in 2017, and you can see the stand has thickened up. Uh, the, there's a tree to the far left that has a blue mark, and this stand has been marked for another selection cut and it's ready to go. We're just waiting for timber markets to improve, particularly for the larger pine, uh, before we move forward on this. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna switch to a group selection. Um, and this has uh, more applicability to Douglas fir and trees that require a lot of light. So here the idea is uh, you're creating um, um, openings of various sizes and these openings regenerate. And so you basically what you have are these mini even age, stand, even age groups, but the whole stand is comprised of, of different ages of these um, mini even age groups. And so if you look at this curve and here's a, here's a technical term, it looks lumpy and bumpy. So group selection, we harvest trees typically in four acre openings or less. Um, beyond four acres, the opening begins to take on the environment of a clear cut. Um, whereas four acres and less, there's substantial shading within the opening that um, uh, is different than a clear cut environment. So you're trying to create again many even age stands and um, your group opening should be large enough to encourage your sun loving species, so like Doug fir. Now I'll come back, this opening size is extremely important. So uh, again, here's um, a stand. Uh, this is gonna, uh, they're falling it in a 70 year old Douglas fir stand. Um, this opening was uh, eventually was three, three quarters of an acre and you can see that prior to the opening it was very dense and shaded and boom now you've got an opening with sun hitting it. Um, at least this is in the early summer when the angle of the sun is high overhead. Uh, on the research forest, the McDonald forest, we created a bunch of these round um, group selection cuts and they were reforested. And here's an example of one. And not all of them did that well. Uh, the half acre opening tended to be too small, but here's one that we, uh, that uh, did pretty well. 
And most of the trees that are doing well within this half acre opening are on the sunny side of the opening. So basically to the right, on the right middle to the right side of this photo is where the sun hits. Uh, but on the far left and even out of the photo, it's, it's highly shaded and the Douglas fir did not do well. A another way to look at this is here's, here is one that, um, uh, that was a, uh, a part of that study. And this, uh, where you see the dotted line was the original kind of th uh, third of an acre to a half acre. And you notice you see uh, a bunch of uh, hardwoods and shrubs and some uh, trees that have made it to the overstory. Um, so if I can, so there's the south, there's the north, and on, just under the north uh, is a road. Uh, what we did, and then prior to that, this is what the stand looked like around it. So a lot of the, the opening on the left was shaded and the Douglas fir did not do well, but the um, hardwoods did. Uh, a few years ago, we expanded this opening uh, to about two acres. So it's a group selection cut, but I left this, this uh, residual half acre as a, as a teaching tool and as a reminder that the opening size is important depending on the species tolerance uh, for light. And as an example here is I got this graph and, it, and you have opening size on the bottom from a quarter acre up to three acres and then you got shade tolerant and shade intolerant trees on the left. So shade intolerant are trees that like a lot of light. Once you get below a half acre, it's really difficult to uh, regenerate um, Douglas fir. So the font size and the boldness uh, show the degree of which, how well they're doing. So small um, font size means they don't do well at this lower end. And of course, as uh, if you're a shade loving tree, the bigger the opening, the more you like it. And so uh, the, the different species here are Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, lodgepole pine, white pine, um, um, spruce, western larch, and red alder. Down on the shade tolerant is that even though they're tolerant, these tree species may be tolerant of shade like western hemlock, western red cedar, or grand fir. They don't necessarily like uh, to have a lot of shade, but as the opening gets bigger, they do better as well. But they'll do better in a smaller opening, say at one acre in size, Western Hemlock, Western Red Cedar will do better than Douglas fir and Ponderosa Pine that you see just immediately above. So um, that should get us going for some discussion. But here's an example of some group selection cuts in, in mixed conifer forest. And here you can see these are about an acre to maybe up to two acres in size. You can see a considerable amount of shade across that uh, opening. Um, and this varies, of course, uh, depending on the angle of the sun, as well as the slope and the, way, and the direction the slope faces. Uh, here's an opening on the group opening on the Hayes property. And this is a small group selection. A fair amount of shade here at this time of day. You see a little sun over uh, in the upper left-hand side of the opening, and that sun will move throughout the days, um, but there may be some trees on the far right that get very little uh, direct sunlight. And if it's Douglas fir, they probably will not do as well as if they were a Douglas fir over on the sunny side of this opening. And this is also a group opening in, in mixed conifer forest in central Oregon. You can see a couple of people in the shade. And this shade will, as I mentioned, move around this opening, depending on the angle of the sun at, at various points of time in the day. There's some ponderosa pine uh, regeneration on the left that's actually doing fairly well. So I suspect that the amount of shade that you see right there now is not uh, too heavy. Otherwise, the pine would, would not be doing as well as it is. Um, but we've been applying some of these group selection methods across our other property. And this is one on our Matson track, which is in Washington County near uh, Hag Lake. And this is about a three and a half acre opening. And we also left some residual trees in here and a snag um, uh, for, for to enhance forest structure and habitat in this, this opening. So um, just uh, kind of um, um, uh, 
a summary here is that looking at um, uneven age management, it involves both the removal of both mature and immature trees. And you can remove trees individually or in groups. Uh, groups tend to be easier, uh, particularly for sun loving trees, and it's easier to harvest. Harvest entries are frequent, and we call that the cutting cycle. And the hope is, is to regenerate, uh, is to have regeneration established every time you create, uh, an, every time you go in and, and, and do a harvest entry. Um, it's important that you get regeneration going, otherwise the system, the multi-age, uneven age system falls apart. Well, I wanna talk, um, this one probably goes really under even age, but I wanted, I separated out here under coppice management. And I know that this is not done a lot. I know a few landowners have managed hardwoods with coppice. And basically coppice is of cutting uh, tree species that will sprout and typically our hardwoods are the ones that sprout, uh, like big leaf maple, alder, and other species. Um, but uh, it's managing the sprouts and I have here good sprout, bad sprout. A good sprout is one that comes off the base of the stump or off roots. A bad sprout is one that comes off the top of the stump. And the reason it's a bad sprout is that that stump will rot and eventually that sprout will break off. Um, so, um, so the question I have for all of you is what conifer re-sprouts and that we use for wood decking? So that's a quiz. So maybe um, Glenn, we can, we can see what, uh, what people say. Uh, I suppose they can put their answers in the, in the Q and A if they want. But, yeah. uh, yep. uh, we want to get that one pretty quick because there's also a lot of other questions to keep track of that are coming in. So, okay. all right, now uh, let's see, we've got some answers that have come in. Uh, I see repeats, uh, cedar, redwood, 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 so, um, and cedar. So what do you think, Steve? Well, okay. Well, those are, those are good. Um, it is. End of quiz. Redwood's a big one. And so here is a redwood, um, with, it's a redwood old growth stump that you can hardly see because of the sprouts that have come up off of it. A lot of these sprouts then, these are large sprouts that, that then are later harvested and used. This would be called second growth um, a redwood and are used in, in milling up of redwood for, for, for decking. Um, so what I wanna do here, okay. So I, I knew a landowner that lives over in the coast range um, and uh, he was actually, coppicing and managing the sprouts to create some fair, some pretty cool high quality uh, big leaf maple. Now, not, I'm not sure not everybody wants to have a lot of big leaf maple, but this particular one came from um, a sprouting clump. And he, have, he cut away the, the other sprouts and, and maintained this um, very straight um, hardwoods. And as you know, as most hardwoods, if they don't have training, if they don't have a lot of other trees around them is that they, they produce very large branches. Think of uh, hardwood trees in a park that are widely spaced. They're not very straight and they have a lot of large, large um, uh, limbs. But, um, you know, in a harvest, a lot of times you get big leaf maple to sprout. And oftentimes there's a center sprout that maybe out distances all the other side sprouts. And these, uh, after a number of years, this, this central sprout can be left and it's trained to grow straight by the side uh, sprouts. And once it gets up and is, you know, maybe 30 feet in height, you can then cut away those other sprouts and maintain the, the best center. You might have actually two good sprouts that you could maintain and eventually um, grow a saw log uh, size um, uh, maple. Uh, for those of you in Southwest Oregon with um, uh, Madrone is that this is um, a, a landowner who where the Squires fire moved in and burned and killed some of his Madrone, uh, which then resprouted because it's a, a sprouting hardwood species, but then went in and started thinning his sprouts to, to create um, 
uh, future firewood. So this, this whole area is a, a, a firewood patch, um, but by removing some of the sprouts, and this would also create potential uh, wood that you could use for specialty woods if you sold it to someone who can saw this up and dry it uh, into furniture or some, some other ornamental wood. So just the summary here, it's really managing hardwoods. Um, and the, what I like about it relies on stump sprouting, which is free, no planting needed, um, a lot of energy in those roots. Um, but managing the sprouts is important to producing a quality, quality tree, whatever your end, end objective is for, the, for that tree. Okay, so that kind of um, um, ends that. I just wanted to touch, so that, that kind of ends the kind of silviculture methods, but there's a couple of things I wanted to emphasize and I think Dan Stark will talk about this, but reforestation options, I'm not gonna go in detail, but of course, uh, planting trees, and I highly recommend this because you won't often get natural seeding in a timely way. But in some places, you may already have regeneration present um, on its own. We call that advanced regeneration. It's there, it occurred on its own. Um, uh, there was no, no in, uh, intentional uh, effort by you to get it, but it came in on its own. And then there's natural uh, regeneration, as we mentioned, where we are, uh, do some kind of a harvest regeneration, like a sea tree, shelter wood, or, uh, or uneven age, where we're trying to get natural regeneration established. And so those are the kind of three primary uh, reforestation options. Of course, for coppice, it's all about sprouting. But in some of the other methods, um, uh, planting, and, and seeding, natural seeding are, are that, but uh, the most important. But I, I have to say that for natural seeding, for it to be successful, you need a seed supply. That is, you gotta have cones, but even the cones have to have, uh, sometimes cones can get cone insects. And so the viability of the seed in the cones can be sometimes low. And that's particularly true for species like Western larch. And Western larch is difficult because one, it doesn't produce cones very often, and two, the, the quality of the seed in the, uh, or the viability of the seed in the cones is usually low. Um, natural regeneration requires um, uh, certain seedbed conditions. Almost all conifers like to regenerate on mineral soil. So mineral soil created by a fire, or mineral soil created by disturbing it with mechanical equipment. Um, they don't, um, regenerating on the duff or the litter layer, you end up with the germinate, germinating seedling where the roots going through the duff and it dries out and the seedling dies. Um, and of course the environment at the time that the, the germinate is germinating in the spring, how hot and dry is it? What kind of the rains are occurring? Um, and so um, all these come into play. And when they all come together is you can actually end up with an overabundance of natural regeneration. But oftentimes it comes in, it trickles in over time. Um, and so that's why you end up with uh, the spacing being more variable and, um, and maybe some change in species over time. So initially you might get trees that, re, that regenerate well on, on mineral soil like ponderosa pine and western larch, and maybe others come in a little later like Douglas fir or grand fir. Uh, of course, this is really difficult in the coast range unless you um, um, uh, either burn the site or create mineral soil with mechanical equipment um, for natural seeding to work. All right, so, so I'm gonna finish up here with getting it done. And this, you know, we can, we can think of a lot of different ways we wanna manage our forest and what we want it to look like. But how you get it there is usually through a logging type of equipment. And so it's important to think about this from the get-go uh, to minimize damage to your trees that you're leaving behind or your regeneration 
um, or in, in soils. And um, so having a well thought out transportation plan for your property is really important. Uh, and have a good logging execution when you actually do a harvest and have a skilled logger. And I say this, um, so for example, if you're doing, um, if you're interested in creating an uneven age forest through individual tree or group selection, uh, you need to look hard for a logger who can do that. If you, you could have a logger who does a great job uh, on the clear cuts, but they do not have the skill or the equipment to do um, um, logging in such a way or partial cutting in that would be required in an uneven age kind of condition. Uh, they're just not set up mentally or with the equipment to do it. Um, so um, you need to spend some time uh, searching for that person and starting with your neighbors or anybody you know that has done a harvest, uh, check with them to see who they had uh, do the work for them and, and talk with them and explain what your objectives are. This is particularly important, like I said, where you're going to be re-entering a stand like with uneven age or multi-age management often because you don't want to damage the residual trees or the regeneration excessively. So your roads, um, you know, what time of year are you going to do? Are your roads, can the log trucks um, get out? Um, are you going to do any of this work in the winter time, which would require uh, um, a rock road, which requires some investment? Or is it going to be done in the summer, uh, summer months? So having your roads so that you have access uh, to your property is an important one. Skid trails. I can't say um, enough on skid trails, but trying to keep them to a minimum, but still you still need access throughout the stand. So lay them out and designate them and so that they're reused and lay them out in such a way that you have adequate access, access across your property. Or if you're working in a stand where you're gonna have multiple entries over time, um, uh, have them well laid out. So here's, a, uh, you know, uh, here's some skid trails with trees that have been felled to lead and to extract out. There have been a few trees here that sometimes uh, they can't fall to lead, they're out of lead, but they can still, uh, with, a, with an equipment like a cat, they can finesse them out without uh, damaging the residual trees. I probably spend most of my time working on this, uh, laying out skid trails in a way that facilitates both the falling in a way that doesn't damage existing trees or regeneration, as well as facilitating the extraction of, of the trees or the logs out of the woods. And so this is where I spend most of my time. So here's a, a skid trail that's been laid out um, and been reused. And when, I, when you say reused is that for some systems like this could be a group selection harvest where we've got skid trails put in and we're gonna be harvesting um, different you know, acre to two acre openings over time is that um, most of the time your skid trails should go right through the opening so that, um, and, the, and the skid trail kept open, right, and, re, and then planted either side of the skid trail. Because if you, um, so for example, we've got some 2000 uh, harvest that we did in 2000, and then we came back in and we're gonna do a harvest in 2010. As we enter one of these skid trails, uh, we don't wanna be running over a lot of regeneration that we just planted in 2000. So um, I like to have skid trails go right through the middle of the opening and then all the trees are felled to the skid trail and, and then out to a landing and then replanted. But the skid trail itself is not replanted because you're gonna reuse it again. So I'm gonna summarize here and then we'll get to your questions. But you know, really all these treatments, they may not be uh, appropriate for everyone at any point in time, but this is the array that uh, civil systems that we use and all our sustainable forestry methods when they're applied appropriately to our forest sites. Now these different uh, civil culture systems and treatments produce a variety of forest structure, wildlife habitat, appearances, uh, forest products and income streams over, over time. 
And an important part of this is really develop a good access plan for your property to facilitate uh, any harvest that you plan to do over time. And in fact, this is one of the first things uh, if you have uh, just obtained some property is to really think about this um, because this will help you in the long run as you begin to more actively manage different stands in different ways. So, I guess I'll stop. I'll leave this up, Glenn. Is that correct? Yeah, and actually, I, I would guess you might want to go back to a slide to help answer some questions. So kind of be at the ready for that, too. Okay. Um, but we definitely want to uh, promote the show that's coming up this afternoon on Oregon Forest Protection Law. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started on questions. So there's quite a few that have come in. I'm actually going to start with one that just popped up. Um, define skid trails. Okay, uh, good question. So a skid trail is a, um, I guess I would call it a, a dirt road that is used by a harvester to go into the stand to um, pick up logs and uh, skid them out to a landing. And then the landing would be adjacent to a, a larger, what we call a haul road. It may be rocked or it may also be a larger um, uh, dirt road. So these are very small um, roads, I guess I would say. Yeah, and if you want, you can uh, stop sharing. We'll do the Q&A um, kind of interview style. And then if you need to, you can bring the slides back up. So um, actually on the topic of skid trails, how far apart should skid trails be ideally? Uh, part of that depends on the, 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 the height of the timber. And also a lot of it depends on the terrain. So I, I like to, and the equipment that you're gonna use. So um, I like, I tend to like my skid trails about a hundred feet apart, but sometimes the terrain is such, you got some steepness, you got a draw. Sometimes your skid trail or a portion of two skid trails will come together a little closer than that and then diverge back out. Um, in some cases, if you're using a, um, like a cut the length machine that reaches out and grabs trees, your skid trails may only be 50 feet apart. So it really depends on the, the terrain. Right, it does. Okay, so we've got a few more questions going here. Um, I'm gonna go back, uh, early on there was a question on the uneven age management. And if you have a project where you don't really have the DBH specified, you're really looking to decide which trees to cut and leave to meet your goals for this, the, the distribution of trees of the different sizes uh, in this mixed age forest. How do you choose between a residual tree and the tree you cut, uh, you know, when you don't really have a spacing specified in this mixed environment, um, all the trees look like quality trees. Uh, how do you decide which trees to cut and which trees to leave? That's a really good question. So um, we have a, a case study that we'll write up that I went in and marked a stand and we're growing the trees only uh, to about um, 28 to 30 inches. And um, what we did is uh, if there were trees above that, and the reason for that is because the mill won't take anything bigger than that, or mills or fewer mills. And so the other thing is bigger trees, when they hit the ground in an uneven age stand, it's kind of like a really big, you know, swath, and it can wipe out a lot of regen. So we're trying to keep our trees a little bit smaller, but um, we at first went in and removed some of the larger trees, what we called oversized, unless they were for wildlife habitat. Or if it had to be a character tree and you wanted to leave it forever, um, you know, that's, but what I look at is trying to leave trees that will respond. So trees that have a really good height growth and are kind of A-shaped in their crown versus ones that have rounded and slowed down in height growth. So um, I tend to leave the dominant and co-dominant trees. Um, if you're trying to create an uneven age stand and you've got a lot of intermediate and suppressed, they are not going to respond. And so um, that's where um, um, you might want to create some openings to get regeneration. 
because a suppressed tree, you could give it all the light in the world and it's just not going to, it's not going to respond. Kind of the next question is in the same vein here, you know, you showed those curves and those targets. How do you set the targets? How do you decide how many trees is the right number in these different size classes? Are there formulas or, you know, what are the factors? Yeah, we have some stuff. Uh, we have a book in, for Eastern Oregon where we talk about this, but d let me just conceptually think about, let's take an even age stand. And some of you have attended my density management uh, classes and you probably attended other courses where there's a zone in even age stands where uh, you, you kind of keep your stand in that where you avoid mortality. And the stand is just open enough that the trees aren't competing too severely to cause mortality. However, because the, the site is still being fully utilized, there's no regeneration space or growing space for regeneration to actually come in. And this is particularly true for uneven age stands. So in many ways you have to for uneven age stands, you have to manage below what you would for an even age stand so that you're always creating some growing space for regeneration to come in and grow. And just as, you know, 10 or 15 years later, just as the stand densifies up and it's starting to exert competitive pressure on that region, you come in and remove some more. But you're always, and then, and then you're trying to secure regeneration. So uh, for uneven age stands, you are down below full stocking uh, temporarily, and you move kind of up and down like that. Just much more as a thinning, you know, you're up a little higher, you thin it down a little bit, but it's still at full stocking. It grows up, you thin it back, it grows up. But the level of, of thinning, uh, the, the level at which you bring a thinning down to is still too dense for, a, for regeneration in a multi-age stand. Does so it's really, a, it's almost a micromanagement from one, one spot at a time. So when you look for the tree to cut because you're picking one over another, it, it seems a little uh, uh, subjective to me, but uh, it's... It, it, is, it is subjective um, to some set point, but you're looking for trees that are healthy. Um, like if you're in Eastern Oregon and you're trying to create an uneven age pine stand, and you've got mistletoe in your overstory tree, an overstory tree, that over, the mistletoe in that overstory tree is going to rain down on your regeneration. And so in that case, I would mark trees that have mistletoe out um, so that my regeneration isn't affected. Um, I have seen um, uneven age pine stands that had a heavy overstory mistletoe and the regeneration is so infected it looks like brush the trees are slow growing and they will never recover from i think we have mistletoe. more work to do to have guidelines on the west side because most of what i've seen is for the the pine and the mixed conifer on the east yeah. side i think most of our issues for multi-age management on the west side is not creating openings or enough light um, or growing space for your regeneration and related to that, um, one more on the uneven age, you're talking about the, the, the graph, the bars on the graph and the trees growing to the right. And somebody was trying to understand what causes the tree growth moving to the right or how does that work? Well, um, so in, you have that, that, that curve and that everything grows to the right. So, so your two inch trees will grow to four inch trees if you're providing if you're doing uh, an entry to reduce the amount of stocking above those trees. So you're constantly uh, manipulating the stocking, reducing the density so that those trees can continue to grow. Uh, sometimes the regeneration can start off pretty good, but if they don't, if you don't uh, reduce the amount of density overhead is that that regeneration starts to stagnate and doesn't move to the right very fast. In fact, may not move to the right at all to eventually replace and grow into the overstory to replace trees that you harvested. Okay, I think what we're gonna do now is we'll pause uh, for um, too many folks leave and we've got plenty of time for more Q&A, but we're gonna do a poll. Um, and so I'm gonna go down to the 
we just want to do a wrap up poll and get your input on our webinar today. So I'm going to launch this poll and then pretty quick, we'll keep going with Q&A, but if you have a chance, please answer the, answer the questions in this poll. So I'll start the poll and if you would just uh, give us your input on the webinar today. And while folks are doing that, here's another question. Um, how do drought and heat affect the selection of your stand management method? Yeah, um, that's a good point. Um, for me, uh, I look at um, both the density that I'm managing my stand at as well as the species that I'm managing for. Uh, I guess the uh, so I look at north slopes and south slopes and uh, south slopes, I would tend to manage them a bit more open and I would leave trees that are more tolerant of, of heat and drought in eastern Oregon in particular, um, where you have mixed conifer sites, I would keep my Douglas fir and larch. Uh, I would probably remove some of my grand fir on the drier sites because they're very susceptible to drought and we see them getting attacked by uh, fur and graver beetle, uh, particularly during heightened droughts. But in the long term, if we see, continue to see temperatures increase, we'll see grand fur um, probably drop out of the, what we call the dry end of the, of the mixed conifer zone. Um, so uh, spe the species is, is really important. Okay, good. Um, a question. I've had natural regeneration of white oaks on the edge of my firs. I'd like to keep the oaks and thin firs over time. What distance should I keep between the little oaks that are now one to three feet and space them later when they get to eight plus feet? Any spacing well, guidelines? You know, <laughs> it's kind of interesting because we really don't have like, there's, there's been a little bit of work on oak uh, thinning and oak restoration not so much in that younger one, but it kind of depends on um, what kind of a form of an oak tree you want. So if you're looking for a, an open grown, large kind of savanna tree that grew in the savanna is, I would space them out 50 feet. But if you're looking for to grow um, a oak that is straighter and perhaps maybe you're gonna use it for firewood or for lumber, is um, I would let them grow up, let them compete with each other for quite a while. They're only eight feet tall now. I'd keep them at that density. And over time, I would space them out, but you know, let their crowns grow and close back in. So they're always growing for the sky and putting their, their branches up or their height growth up and not out. So it kind of depends on the objective for why you're growing the oak. Well, the oaks grow so slowly. You have a lot of time to figure it out. But uh, once they get, <laughs> once they, they wake up and grow a little faster uh, when they're 20 or 30, then so, you can. Yeah, the question would be is how much influence does the dug fir have over those oaks? And so you may want to remove more of the dug fir. I, I don't know the situation, but just, just an idea. Well, that's a key. The Douglas fir will outgrow the oak, and you really have to keep the dug fir at a distance. Yeah, the, we, call, we call them that social distancing at this point. <laughs> yeah. With uneven age management, how do you use prescribed fire to make your forest more fire resilient? Um, well, it, it kind of depends on the scale and both the temporal and spatial, but uh, on the particular forest that I showed, uh, in the short run, we're not, we're not interested in using fire there. But I have some research on the east side where um, if you had an, a pine stand and you're okay with the irregularities that fire occur, that creates, is that fire can maintain an uneven age stand, but it's going to be way more open and it may kill trees that you um, want to keep or it may not kill trees that you wanted to kill. And so, um, but over the long run, um, most of our pine stands were maintained in an uneven age fashion through periodic fire every five to 25 years. Now, 
you could influence that by the prescribed fire, both by its timing and by um, during the year when mo certain levels of moisture, as well as um, how the prescribed fire, how the fire is laid down, and that can affect the intensity. And so uh, sometimes I've seen intensities too low to, to remove enough trees. And then in other cases where big pine uh, where the prescribed fire was to open the stand up and, and keep big pine around ended up killing the big pine because of the deposition of bark at the base of big pines. It's a big duff layer. Fire gets in there and it smolders for days and it kills the cambium. Hey Steve, could you share your, uh, that last slide uh, that has the, the next show on it? And then um, if you can share your screen again and go to that last slide. Okay, hold on. And then uh, while he does that, um, we're at 11.30, uh, but we are happy to hang around. Uh, overtime Q&A goes until 11.45, and I see we have several more questions in the Q&A. So we're going to stay here and answer the questions, and we invite you to do the same. We're, met, we're putting Steve through the paces here, multitasking, so. There you go. All right. And then let's see. Are you sure? Okay, well, we can see that and I'll go ahead with the Q&A. Okay. So I have a property where reforestation occurred on the skid trail. Is there a practice where it is reused once the replanted trees are full growth and ready to be harvested again? Um, a large company planted it that way, just curious why. Okay, so let me break that apart. So there's a skid trail and it regenerated naturally is that well it's it sounds like <clears throat> it may have been you know it's a previous operation and anywhere there were trees planted on the skid trail um uh, uh, so i'm not sure actually what the question is is there a okay. practice where it could be reused once the trees are uh, ready to be harvested again i yeah i think um I know that what we do is we'll plant trees on the immediate, immediate side of the skid trail. We usually typically don't plant the skid trail unless the skid trail has been ripped, you know, where the compaction's broken up. But um, if you were going to want to reuse that skid trail and, and down the road, if the trees get big enough, you could harvest them out of the skid trail and then reuse it. Um, sometimes I've seen where skid trails, because skid trails um, have a lot of mineral soil, and as I mentioned, conifers like to regenerate in mineral soil. Sometimes you can get a carpet of regeneration that starts on a skid trail. But what happens is when the roots go down, they flatten out. And so their root structure isn't very good. So there's sometimes a tendency for a landowner not to want to destroy this free regeneration, but uh, you really should reuse that skid trail um, because those trees are will be under stress later because of the compacted soil. Another one. When doing pre-commercial thinning, can this be done in the spring as well as the fall? Is there a reason why I should not do it in the spring? Um, it would depend on uh, what species uh, you're, you're cutting and uh, where you're at. So for pines, um, uh, pre-commercial thinning, particularly if the material is getting above two and a half, three inches, in diameter is uh, I would I would pre-commercially thin that in uh, late August to September um, and that what that does is that there's a, a beetle called the pine engraver beetle it's called Ips Ips pinei it tends to um, uh, the beetle comes out in the spring it looks for trees under stress or it looks for green slash if there's green slash that's been laid on the ground in the spring or early summer uh, they'll go in there and breed, and then the, the uh, larvae mature and come back out in the middle of summer, and then now they're looking for additional trees to attack. If you do it in the late summer and fall, you've avoided the natural uh, cycle of, of this particular um, beetle. So it's particular to pine and a lot of times um, in um, eastern Oregon, but it could happen in the gorge or... Um, in the Willamette Valley as well. Okay, very good. Um, that's the end of the, uh, the the written questions from the audience so far. Um, I kind of have a, ge a general question, Steve. You seem to have more experience with uneven age management than almost any other forester I know. 
and uh, we rely on you and team up with you to do more of these trials. Um, so how do you see uh, uneven age management in Western Oregon? I mean, you're doing it on the school for us and, and there's quite a few landowners that keep trying it. And kind of what's your outlook and is that, you know, a growing part of our toolkit? I think it's a growing part. It's not like growing really fast. For me, I've always been interested in it and trying to think about um, different ways that we can manage forests um, that meet landowner objectives. And so um, we scientifically and operationally, we know a lot about clear cutting, I mean, hands down. And that's a good way to, to you know, regenerate and grow Douglas fir or some other sun loving species, red alder. But not everybody wants to manage their forest that way. So the question is, are there other ways that we might do that? And so my interest, I've always been interested in it. Um, it, it doesn't mean that uneven age management can or should be practiced everywhere. Um, um, and so, but I want to know under what conditions it will work. So on the research for us, we've been looking at different size of openings going more towards group selection rather than individual tree selection in Western Oregon to be able to get uh, Douglas fir and others. On the east side, uh, one of the things about uneven age management there, particularly with individual tree selection, if you're only taking a, a small number of trees and you're not creating enough growing space, you may end up converting your stand from say pine and larch to more grand fir, Douglas fir. And in the long term, that's a problem, particularly with the grand fir because they're susceptible to, um, to, they like the shade, the light shade that's created by removing some trees above them and they'll regenerate. But over the long run, uh, it creates a stand that is susceptible uh, from a forest health perspective. And so in, in thinking about um, being purposeful about uh, what do I want, what kind of regeneration do I want, and how do I get it. So understanding the characteristics of each tree, their tolerance is really important in, this, uh, in the uneven age management systems. Thank you. Yeah, that's something we're all working on, and it's it's obviously more complicated, but it's also more satisfying once uh, you get you it know, to work. I, I, in some hands, it would drive some people nuts to manage at the micro scale. But if you're anal, you probably love it. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this here, and I'm going to do this over there, and I'm going to release that tree, and I'm going to get some regeneration going over there. So it kind of depends on how much how much you want um, it's a really up and personal type of management versus say a clear cut where you're managing a large area um, more extensively. All right. Thank you, Steve. Well, I think we're at the end. I want to let folks know that um, there's another uh, webinar on thinning on June 16th. We're going to have Brad with her Robinson really focused on sort of that intermediate stage of stand development and thinning. Um, so if you are interested in that aspect, of course, that's an important part of, of most of these methods. So uh, thank you, Steve, and thanks everyone for hanging in there. Thank um, you. And uh, tune in this afternoon if you want to check out the Oregon Forest Protection Laws and webinar there with Mike Clausey and Joe Goldsby. And uh, see you next time. Thanks again.